In 1856, in the Ninda Valley of Prussia, now Germany, limestone cutters discovered the partial skeleton of a thick-boned, brow-ridged hominin in a cave. A German anthropologist named Hermann Schaffhausen examined the bones. In an 1861 paper, titled On the Crania of the Most Ancient Races of Man, Schaffhausen noted that, in the most ancient crania, the occipital was the most, and the frontal region the least developed, and that the increase in the elevation of the latter marked the transition from barbarous to civilized man. He continued, writing that, this condition is manifested in the most remarkable manner in the Neanderthal cranium, which must have given the human visage an unusually savage aspect. What's more, he concluded that the human bones and cranium from the Neanderthal exceed all other skulls in those peculiarities of conformation, which lead to the conclusion of their belonging to a barbarous and savage race. However, his contemporary, Irish geologist William King, disagreed. King noted that the skull of this fossil, with its strong ape-like tendencies, was distinct from modern man. In 1863, King declared it a new species, which he named Homo neanderthalensis. Scientists have been arguing over whether Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis are truly separate species ever since. Neanderthals were even called Homo sapiens neanderthalensis at one point, before being moved back into their own species. By appearances alone, Neanderthal fossils resemble ours, they are clearly members of our hominin family tree. But on closer examination, Neanderthal features are also quite distinct. There was intense debate back and forth. Was this fossil just a weird variant of human, a more primitive, brutish-looking thing than living humans, or was it something really different? Moreover, these members of our genus have long occupied two different branches on the family tree. But now that researchers think these groups interbred, scholars are giving serious consideration to whether we are the same species after all. Many anthropologists use the term human to not only mean modern Homo sapiens, but also many other hominin species on our family tree. In other words, for some scholars, Neanderthals have always been human, as members of the genus Homo. In this video, I use the term human broadly, while using Homo sapiens to refer to the only living species of the lineage, and modern humans to point to all humans living today. Around 200,000 years ago, in the Levant region of the Middle East, a small band of tech-savvy humans dragged home and dismembered a bounty of wildlife. Using exquisitely pointed flint spearheads and blades, they hunted and butchered myriad prey, including gazelles, deer, and now extinct aurochs, the ancestors of modern cattle. Decades ago, archaeologists discovered the upper jaw and teeth of a Homo sapiens that dated to between 177,000 and 194,000 years old in Israel's Mislia cave, with animal bones and sharp tools nearby. In the cool, humid climate of the coastal plain, these early Homo sapiens foraged for acorns in nearby forests of oak, olive, and pistachio. They ate the saline leaves of shrubby saltbush and lugged ostrich eggs back to the cave where they slurped down the yolks. It's probable that these humans migrated to the Arabian Peninsula more than 200,000 years ago, trekking along lush corridors out of Africa. We don't know how many crossed, and how many of them perished, and how many went back, we only know that these people arrived. We also know that they were likely not alone. Based on small finds of teeth and bones from local caves, we know that the area was inhabited by Neanderthal-like creatures or the predecessors of Neanderthals at that time. While out exploring, Homo sapiens may have mated with these Neanderthal-like inhabitants. That is to say that, in this land, that later birthed the Bible, they likely knew each other in the biblical sense. The humans who lived in the Mislia cave were part of a population that many scholars suspect ultimately died out. Later waves of Homo sapiens that, left the African continent, succeeded in reproducing and spreading out. But braided into the story of those human migrations is that of Neanderthals, members of our family tree, closest to modern humans, who may have first evolved in Europe from our ancestors some 400,000 years ago. For hundreds of thousands of years, modern humans as well as archaic humans, such as Neanderthals and Denisovans, 
have been crossing modern-day borders that were not existing in the past, and multiple times admixing and exchanging genetic material. Still other research indicates that gene flow from early Homo sapiens into Neanderthals might have occurred much earlier in humanity's story, around the time that the Mislia cave Homo sapiens were sucking out the yolks of those ostrich eggs. Moreover, both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals shared a propensity for primping. Neanderthals made jewelry out of animal teeth, shells, and ivory. They decorated themselves with feathers and probably red ochre as well. Using mathematical models, researchers discovered that at one point, the proportion of Neanderthal DNA in humans alive today was as high as 10%, and that proportion later dwindled. That 10% figure is significant because other researchers have estimated Homo sapiens outnumbered Neanderthals 10 to 1. Many scientists now suspect that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals met and mingled their genes multiple times. Geneticists have documented how Neanderthal genes survive today among modern humans, evidence of these earlier instances of interbreeding. The first time Homo sapiens and Neanderthals met was likely in the region that is now Israel. Just as the Mislia cave helps establish how long anatomically modern humans were present in the region, tools associated with Neanderthals, such as spearheads and knives, have been found in other caves in Israel. New studies, made possible in part by computational techniques that enable researchers to analyze huge quantities of genetic data, show that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals interbred far more than previously imagined. Indeed, their proclivity for pairing off has led many researchers to question the old dictum that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens were separate species. Such ideas raise questions as to what it really means to be a distinct species. They also raised the possibility that perhaps Homo sapiens did not drive Neanderthals to extinction, as some have suggested. Rather, one species may have simply absorbed the other, and so, Neanderthals, in a sense, survive within us. Nonetheless, there is a lot of anatomical differences between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Homo sapiens are flat-faced. The Neanderthal face sticks out. Neanderthals had boxy, stout bodies and their major arm and leg bones were thick. Homo sapiens, by contrast, have thinner, gracile bodies. Neanderthals had different teeth and thumb lengths, as well as longer collarbones. However, the argument might have been confined to questions of anatomy had it not been for a singular discovery. An evolutionary geneticist extracted bits of DNA from Neanderthal fossils, and published an early version of the Neanderthal genome. The findings showed that between 1 and 4% of the genomes of modern non-African humans consist of Neanderthal DNA. That overlap suggested that our Homo sapiens ancestors could have had intimate encounters with Neanderthals. That study would be the first of many to indicate that these two hominins interbred, and such studies matter to the question of whether Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are one or two species. But genetic research has long faced a challenge in scale. There are an estimated 21,000 genes in the human genome that code for proteins, complex molecules that do most of the work in cells, and play crucial roles in the body. Sequencing these genes involves studying the 3 billion DNA base pairs that make up the human genome. By the classic definition of a species, if two organisms can breed and produce fertile offspring, it means that they belong to the same species. The intuitive explanation is that there were multiple episodes of interbreeding and that populations in East Asia interbred more. That evidence for admixing between Neanderthals, Denisovans, and modern humans indicates that all of these populations belong to a single lineage. That study examined DNA collected from an approximately 120,000-year-old femur bone excavated in a cave in southwestern Germany. Specifically, mitochondrial DNA, genetic information handed down from mother to child, found within the cell's energy-generating structures called mitochondria. The analysis concluded that the ancestors of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens interbred at some point between 270,000 and 220,000 years ago, most likely in the Levant. Taken together, these studies strengthen the case that Homo sapiens-Neanderthal pairings occurred, and that such mating was by no means unusual. 
rather, Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and their hybrids all interbred. And that mixing may have occurred as early as some of the first forays of modern human ancestors out of Africa. If a species is defined in large part by the ability to breed and have young who can also reproduce, one might argue that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are indeed one species. And many of the scientists who work on these studies agree, yet some experts still contend otherwise. Although dozens of hominins once existed, scientists have only sequenced the genomes of a few specimens, whose species they could clearly identify by their morphology. Because we don't know how many hominin species there were, and because the vast majority have not had their DNA sequenced, we can't know how many of these hominins had genes that were specifically Denisovan or Neanderthal. Therefore, there is no way of knowing whether the DNA sequences extracted from Neanderthals were exclusive to Neanderthals. In this scenario, Neanderthals never went extinct. They, or their genes, were simply absorbed into modern humans. In other words, Instead of dying out through violence or starvation, the Neanderthal population hybridized with Homo sapiens. Over time, however, modern humans lost significant amounts of Neanderthal DNA, perhaps because it carried harmful mutations. Indeed, another research team found that most Neanderthal genes survive in Homo sapiens in regions of non-coding DNA. The regions that are most important for function, the protein coding genes, are depleted of Neanderthal DNA. It is possible that Neanderthals did not truly die off at all but simply melted together with the human species. One could perhaps argue that Neanderthals did not disappear due to warfare or competition, but due to interbreeding. If they are right, then whether we were once one species or two does not matter, because we are all one now. Some scholars suspect that fierce competition between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals pushed the latter from the warmer Levant into an ice-covered Europe. The world was almost empty, so the way I see this, and probably most people would not agree with me, the European Neanderthals had no other choice but to live in the frozen north. For the moment then, the answer to whether or not Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis were the same species is still up for debate, along with the entire concept of species. But the larger message that comes through with each wave of findings is simple. Despite a long history of derogatory caveman descriptors, Homo neanderthalensis was probably a lot like us. But many mysteries remain. Did Homo sapiens and Neanderthals whisper sweet nothings to each other, beneath the leaves of a pistachio tree? Was there some pheromone that attracted one to the other? We can only speculate. I wanted to tell you about Brilliant. The sponsor of this video. Learn interactively with Brilliant's fun hands on lessons in math, science, and computer science. Interactive learning helps you learn six times more effectively than watching lecture videos. Instead of just memorizing, they teach you how to think about STEM by guiding you through fun problems. You'll get practice with real problem solving, that helps you train your critical thinking and creative problem solving skills. With Brilliant, Anyone can understand concepts in STEM. In school, people are often trained to apply formulas to rote problems. But this traditional approach prevents deeper understanding of concepts, reduces independent critical thinking, and cultivates few useful skills. The capacity to think critically separates the great from the good. Brilliant is a fun and interactive way to learn real problem solving and deeply understand STEM. Join the millions of people already learning on Brilliant with a special offer just for listeners. Head to brilliant.org forward slash highly compelling to get started for free with Brilliant's interactive lessons. The first 200 listeners will also get 20% off an annual membership. Click the link in the description. Thanks for watching. Please check out these other videos or join us in the comments section. If you're not yet subscribed, please click that big red button now, so you don't miss any of our highly compelling videos. Thank you.